You are listening to the Hemp Startup Journey. My name is Jason De Los Santos, co-founder of Spectrum Labs, a hemp extraction facility in Asheville, North Carolina. I'm sitting down with hemp entrepreneurs, scientists, and politicians willing to share their perspectives, lessons learned, and how we can make an impact on the hemp and cannabis industry for everyone. All right, Jenna Wadsworth, thank you so much for joining me on the Hemp Startup Journey today. Welcome. Thanks for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with y'all uh, a little bit more about hemp. Yeah, absolutely. So really excited to talk with you. Um, but uh, before we get into all the stuff about just you know hemp and uh, maybe some of the, the platforms that you're running and, and how, what you think you can do uh, as commissioner of agriculture, um, Let's say that you are at uh, at a gathering event, and it's kind of a weird time to ask this question, just because of you know COVID. But um, when somebody asks you, "What do you do?" How do you respond to that? Well, I serve my community, so I am currently the Democratic nominee for North Carolina Commissioner of Agriculture. And for the last 10 years, I've been elected in Wake County, serving the 1.2 million people who call our Capital County home as their soil and water conservation district supervisor. But I also grew up on a small farm that raised hogs, cow, chicken, short, corn, cotton, tobacco, and soybeans um, in Eastern North Carolina. And I still help operate that, that farm to this day with my father. Okay, cool. Very nice. That, uh, that would probably perk up a few ears. <laughs> um, so then it, we'll, we'll, we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, the commissioner of agriculture. Uh, but, you know, one thing, just myself personally, uh, I'm, you know, aging, I have, a, I have a family, I have a couple daughters. And so I think just naturally as people uh, start adulting, they start being more, more conscious about politics and just, you know, our government. Um, and in the last few days, just trying to coordinate for this podcast, I realized that I don't really know what the commissioner of agriculture does. Right. Like I, I've heard the title plenty of times, but like what what would you actually do? Yeah, um, you know, you bring up a really good point. So this office is incredibly important. It's just often overlooked. And I think that's because folks don't realize the role that it plays in their everyday life. And so just for a little bit of context, agriculture is still our state's biggest, the most economically important industry. And it brings in something like $92.7 billion annually to our state's economy and employs- Billion with a B? With a B, wow. yes. Um, and employs over 770,000 individuals from Murphy to Manio. So this is a massive industry. And the North Carolina Department of Agriculture itself has something like 2000 employees stationed in 99 out of our 100 counties. because. Um, it also includes aquaculture, fisheries, and forestry. So, I mean, this is just a massive department. And the primary goal of the Commissioner of Agriculture, who's a member of the Council of State, the Executive Cabinet with the Governor, um, is to oversee and maintain and enhance the ability of agriculture to provide an adequate storage of food and fiber Mm -hmm. for North Carolina. Okay. So what does that mean? It means supporting your farmers, giving them new viable economic opportunities to be successful, making sure that consumers, the people who call North Carolina home, have access to healthy, nutritious food, fiber. Um, and in addition to that, I mean, the commissioner oversees about 75 different laws enacted by the legislature that deal with the industry, oil and gas, uh, pesticides, uh, fertilizer application, everything like weights and measures. So making sure when you go to the grocery store and you buy like prepackaged two pounds of pineapple that you're actually getting two pounds, mm -hmm. um, drugs, cosmetics. I mean, there's just a whole bunch of stuff that falls underneath this office. But I mean, just this is probably a little bit oversimplistic, but if you eat, you should absolutely care about who is sitting in this office. Hmm. Um, if you know you're breathing, you want to breathe clean air. You should absolutely care about who's sitting in this office. If you want clean drinking water, you should absolutely care about who's sitting in this office. And I'm someone who believes that our state's biggest and most important industry should be led by somebody who shares our values and priorities and who actually wants to serve the people who call North Carolina home instead of out of state or international corporations that denigrate our environment and natural resources, don't treat their laborers fairly or don't prioritize animal welfare. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. I, that was a, I think that's a good line. Like if you eat or you breathe, this will be important to think about who's sitting in, in that, in that seat. 
Uh, it's really interesting. So um, is it is it fair to say that it is your only opponent at this point, uh, the current um, uh, department the current head? Commissioner, who's Steve. been there for 15 years, yeah. 15 years, yeah, Steve Troxler, and uh, who I think has had a, a sort of a contentious relationship with hemp farmers, it seems like, over the past few years. He has, with hemp farmers, and I would contend with a lot of small farmers, too, especially small farmers in Western North Carolina, okay. who haven't gotten all the resources that they need. Same thing for Black farmers. Okay. So uh, I was going to wait until later, but since uh, this topic came up, so can you talk about some differences of why somebody would consider, let's say, voting for you versus um, Mr. Troxler? Yeah. So again, so like kind of this idea that um, I am not bought and paid for by in large agribusinesses or, or corporate interests. Mm -hmm. uh, I made a commitment early on not to take any corporate PAC money. I'm also the mm -hmm. only statewide candidate on either side of the aisle, though one surprises me a little less than um, the other who signed a pledge not to take any money from fossil fuel packs or fossil fuel executives and not to support any new pipeline projects. Uh, most of my support during this campaign has come from individuals. It's come from people who call North Carolina home, who live and work here and want to see a better state, a more just, equitable, and sustainable future for everyone who calls this state home. Uh, and when you're comparing the two of us, um, you know, I would contend that in the 15 years that he's been there, he's grown complacent. And, you know, I don't want people to think that I'm just saying the things that I am because of the difference in our parties. I am the Democratic nominee. I'm a good Democrat. But um, in years past, I actually voted for Steve Troxler because I thought he was the best person to lead the industry forward. I thought he um, was concerned about the well-being and welfare of our farmers. But you know, I feel like he is not fighting for us, especially if you're a small farmer. And most small farmers would contend that they haven't had an advocate in this office in a very long time. Um, their access to resources and new market opportunities, including my support for the legalization of cannabis, um, which wouldn't just be an economic opportunity for our farmers and for our rural communities, uh, but also for our budgets across the state that would benefit from the influx of extra tax dollars, a way to combat the opioid epidemic. Um, but I also see the legalization of cannabis as an opportunity to begin to achieve true social justice for communities of color who have been disproportionately criminalized and locked up on the basis of possession charges versus Caucasian users for far too long, despite the fact that data shows us that white folks and black folks are using cannabis at roughly the same rate. And you can't tell me that it is not a social justice and social equity issue, that right now there are black men sitting in prison for doing something that's legal in a propensity of other states across this country, 33 plus DC, by the way. Um, and now they're more likely to contract COVID-19 because it is a social justice and social equity issue. It's also a failure of both legislative uh, Democrats and Republicans who haven't moved forward on this issue and continually, continually let medical marijuana bills fail. Um, and so, you know, I think there's an opportunity to talk about social justice through this office. I also think there's an opportunity to talk about environmental justice. So the difference between me and my opponent, I know that climate change is real. I also understand that storms are gonna grow more intense and more frequent over the coming years. So not addressing the root cause of so many of the issues that farmers are facing throughout the state is absolutely a dereliction of duty on behalf of the current commissioner. And it's also a dereliction of duty uh, to, to serving the consumers of North Carolina who depend on farmers for that storage of food and fiber for the future. And in the 15 years that my opponent has been sitting in this office, he recently said that one of his top accomplishments is getting Democrats and Republicans in the legislature to agree to cut relief checks to farmers after the last few major storm events. Now, I'm not going to argue that those farmers didn't need that money. They absolutely did, but they needed that money because he sat on his hands and instead of using the tools and resources available to him from this position of power, he didn't do anything to mitigate the effects of these natural disasters on the well-being and welfare of our farmers. Mm -hmm. And I think that there has to be a better solution to dealing with natural disasters than just cutting a relief check every single time there's a 500-year flood event. Um, and so I want to create a division within the Department of Agriculture that works to specifically address climate change, build resiliency into our farm and community planning, connect the dots, um, look at using renewables on our farms, make them accessible and affordable, talk about moving into regenerative practices that prioritize soil health, look at organic practices. I want to put a garden on every school ground, not just as a teaching opportunity for our children. Um, I've been endorsed by the teachers union. They're really, really excited about this, uh, but also as a way to start talking about food insecurity. So that's the other one of the other biggest differences between my opponent and myself. Um, most people may not realize that 
we, North Carolina is the third most agriculturally diverse state in the country, but we're also um, one of the top 10 most food insecure states in the country, despite the fact that we're the most agriculturally in the nation, which that it's not that we don't have the capacity to produce enough food to feed our people, we just aren't prioritizing that. We have a values and priorities problem in this state. And the fact that one in five children do not know where their next meal is coming from, I think that's absolutely criminal. Um, I'm committed to, to creating programs where one day maybe we don't have agricultural subsidies. We work with the legislature to contract with our small farmers, make sure that they're moving from monoculture into diversification, which again is better for soil health and, and talking about environmental justice and environmental resources. Um, and so they've got a you know, guaranteed revenue pathway and then that's the food that ends up on our children's plates. They get additional nutrition. They have a better tasting uh, meal. Um, you know, there's just so many ways that we can address some very big problems that we're facing in society if we just use the, the resources and think about connecting the dots. And that's why the last part of my platform is about bridging the urban rural divide by advocating for meaningful investments in rural healthcare. Because if you're not healthy, you can't be economically productive. And the average age of the farmer in North Carolina is actually two years older than what it is nationally. Um, we should have already expanded Medicaid, uh, you know, and on that topic too, we also have to destigmatize mental health counseling in rural areas. And I say that because of all of this lack of leadership in agriculture for years, um, the inability to recognize climate change is real, getting us into trade wars every single time we turn around, um, seeing what tar what's happening with tariffs, the fact that even with COVID-19, we're seeing a double digit drop on the international commodity market for some of the top 10 crops that North Carolinians are engaged in producing. Um, as a result of all of that lack of leadership, farmers are facing something called farm stress. I encourage people to check out what ECU is doing um, in regards to this. But as a result of that, they're going bankrupt at record rates here in the Southeast United States. And as a result of that, we're seeing more farmers commit suicide or struggling with mental health than ever before. And you know, I think that the leader of this industry should be screaming from the rooftops and raising awareness about the fact that farmers feel hopeless and helpless enough that they are ending their life. Um, and you know, that's problematic for every single person who calls the state home. Um, the people with the institutional knowledge and know-how to produce our food are ending their lives. And so we absolutely have to look at this from every single angle in order to address this problem. And the other way that we bridge the urban rural divide is by making meaningful investments in rural broadband access. Because if you don't have the access to technology to compete in the statewide or global marketplace, you're gonna get left behind. Not just that, you know, people could hook up tablets to their irrigators, to their sprayers. I mean, you could move into more sustainable practices. You could use drones to look at your fields, um, to measure to measure droughts or anything else. Look at soil health. I mean, we're just not we're just not thinking ahead and planning ahead to create a more sustainable and just industry for the future. Um, and you know, honestly, on the broadband piece, I will also just say that I think it's it's absolutely ridiculous that before this pandemic we had children having to go sit in McDonald's parking lots and public library parking lots in order to access free Wi-Fi to do their homework. Mm -hmm. But now that their long-term educational and career outcomes are primarily gonna be defined by their ability to achieve in a virtual environment, it is absolutely critical that we make these investments. And you know, the other thing that I would love to address versus my opponent, and I would love to work with our labor commissioner to make this happen, is to put humanity back into governing and politics, to look at our farm workers and our undocumented workers who make up um, the bulk of the workers in our you know, meat packing plants and in this agricultural industry, the people who are the backbone of the industry uh, and the way that they are being treated and the fact that the CDC and OSHA, I don't know if you saw this recently, um, mm -hmm. in September, the CDC and OSHA uh, issued guidance stating that because farm workers are considered essential agricultural employees, that even if they have been exposed to someone with COVID-19, if they are allegedly asymptomatic, they are to continue reporting to work. And my opponent signed guidance saying that he supports that. Um, and you know, we're just gonna depend on these big agribusinesses, by the way, the same ones that are funding his campaign and setting the priorities and agenda at our Department of Agriculture. We're just gonna expect them all of a sudden to behave and do what they're supposed to, to perform temperature checks, to separate employees into small groups, to provide adequate PPE access, when clearly they've already shown us that they're incapable of doing that because we saw all of the closures at meatpacking plants across the country because of COVID-19 outbreaks early on in this pandemic. Um, you know, a lot of these workers, well, I would contend all of these workers are underpaid, they are overworked and they are underappreciated. And, you know, it's time to 
treat them with the dignity and respect that they deserve. Because the reality is most of us wouldn't be able to put food on our plates without them. Um, and while the Commissioner of Agriculture doesn't affect immigration policy, they can absolutely be a vocal advocate, a loud voice in the room to say that the people who pick our food, the people who make the industry work deserve a moral pathway to citizenship. And I think that a truly great America would have already addressed the immigration crisis instead of treating it like a pest problem. And furthermore, as the effects of climate change continue to intensify and grow more frequent, I think that we're gonna see a flood of climate refugees coming to this country, seeking shelter and looking for hope and opportunity. And that's why, that's why I believe that the person who is leading our state's biggest and most economically important industry is someone who's able to give a nod to our past, build upon our agricultural heritage, who has a vision for a more just, sustainable and equitable future that works for all of us and the actual ability to implement that vision. That is why I'm running for North Carolina Commissioner of Agriculture. Okay, um, thank you for that. So is um, just on a, maybe more of a, I guess maybe a, a understanding the, the position. So, cause are you right now, I guess in 2010, you were elected to the, let me see if I get this right. The Wake County Soil and Water Conservation District Board of Supervisors, is that right? Yes. Okay. That's a lengthy, you probably could not fit that on a business card. <laughs> it, it's a mouthful no matter how many years I've been saying it. Yeah. 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 So um, is that, I don't know, again, like political jargon I'm not very familiar with, but is, is this, if you're elected to the commissioner of agriculture, is this sort of a, a step up from that position, I would assume? Yeah. So actually um, soil and water conservation, that department of, you know, all the soil and water supervisors who are elected and appointed throughout the state, which mm -hmm. there's soil and water districts basically in every county. There's some coast, there's a coastal region where they kind of all are just like one board because they deal with very different environmental issues than the, the rest of us. Mm -hmm. um, but there are soil and water supervisors basically elected or appointed from every, from every county in North Carolina. But the soil and water conservation um, division falls under the North Carolina Department of Agriculture and Consumer mm -hmm. Services. Gotcha. And the commissioner himself was actually a soil and water supervisor in Guilford County. So a slightly smaller county um, before he was elected statewide. Gotcha. This okay. office. Very interesting. Um, I have to commend you and any other person that runs for for public office. I, I don't know. It, it seems like it's not even just a stress, but just uh, with everything that you said, right? Like you're considering your platform to be you know, the, the 10 or 12 different things that you mentioned. And uh, it's like so many things. It seems like everything is a priority because, you know, like I might have a priority and I might say like, Jenna, like I want you to do this. And then somebody else will say like, no, Jenna, I want you to focus on this. Uh, and just the balance of trying to figure out like, how do you prioritize? all these things. Um, but then just, you know, niching down a little bit more into, into hemp specifically, which is what a lot of the folks listening to this will be in the industry of. Um, have you spoken with hemp farmers or people in, in the industry? And if so, what are you hearing from them? People asking you like, hey, I want you to do this or focus on this. Yeah. So, you know, I guess I should probably just backtrack a little bit and say that in my role as a soil and water conservation district supervisor, we work to preserve and conserve natural resources and wildlife, and, and we do so by supporting our agricultural producers, our landowners, our land users, which so that includes like people who rent farmland, um, as well as, you know, talking about environmental education work. And so we really do work to support our farmers here in Wake County. And early on when farmers were interested in hemp, um, I asked to have a, a presentation in particular about, you know, industrial hemp and what, what the Department of Agriculture was doing, what the licensing process looked like, um, what the testing of THC content looked like, what, what all that looked like, because I wanted to make sure I was informed for our producers. Um, and so, you know, I, while I won't pretend to be any sort of expert on hemp compared to, you know, some great individuals that I have been able to learn from um, in this industry who, you know, do this every single day, uh, talking about hemp and making sure that we can really support this industry, which could be a viable economic industry for our farmers, uh, is really, really important to me. And it has been kind of a cornerstone of my campaign, um, even though, you know, something I probably talk about more is the legalization. Of but, you know, we should absolutely be supporting our hemp farm, coming this new market opportunity into the state. I feel like the current commissioner has done what he could to ensure that this industry works and is successful. Okay. Um, so, oh, let's see. Jenna, can you still hear me? I'm getting a message that internet is unstable. 
I can hear uh, you. Okay, good deal. Um, so with, um, let's see, can we talk about smokable hemp in, in the state? That's been uh, a pretty big issue for the last couple of years. And uh, so last, uh, I think it was last year, the bill SB 315, I think it almost passed, it was trying to ban smokable hemp and then, then it was allowed You're about to... when it was originally in the Farm Act. Yeah. Um, so what the, can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think there, there are still a lot of folks that want to ban hemp for a multitude of reasons. Uh, what, uh, what have you heard about that? Is there any progress or, you know, like where, where do we stand? Um, so, you know, I think if folks think that they want to ban hemp or smokable hemp, I think it's because we at the, you know, we in agriculture, in particular, the North Carolina Department of Agriculture didn't do a good enough job educating consumers about the hemp industry. And, and getting rid of any potential misnomers or, or miseducation or misinformation. And so, you know, education is key in making sure that people understand why this industry matters so much to farmers and growers and processors who are engaged in the, in the hemp industry. Mm -hmm. uh, and when the smokable hemp ban was mentioned kind of in the first round of this, of the Farm Act in the legislature, in the North Carolina legislature, um, and it, it, you know, it was removed, hemp is, hemp is still, legal in the state, um, you know, because I think I also hear that a lot from people, again, some, some confusion and misunderstanding. Yeah. But, but the smokable hemp ban, I think what really upset me is that the commissioner didn't come out and say that he himself was against a, a ban, uh, that he was against a ban on smokable hemp. Um, and, you know, we saw a lot of law, law enforcement members who supported a ban on smokable hemp um, under trying to use the justification that if they were to pull someone over, um, that they wouldn't be able to distinguish between a hemp product and a cannabis, a marijuana product. And, you know, that created a number of issues. I would contend that there was, I don't even want to say veiled racism, um, but there's clearly some like structural racism inherent in, in the idea that, you know, most of the people that they were probably pulling over and, and being concerned about this anyways and wanted to use this as a, a reason to pull them over were probably people of color. Um, and so I was really upset when the commissioner, the Department of Ag didn't come agricultural product, our farmers need this support, like let's fight to remove the smokable hemp ban from the Farm Act. Um, and processors were absolutely, you know, devastated that they lose access to this to this viable economic opportunity for them. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so one of the things that uh, recently happened was that the hemp pilot program was extended for another year. And it's September twenty first, twenty twenty one. Twenty twenty one, and so that was a big issue for the past few weeks. I mean, it, us as processors, you know, we weren't worried about like our, you know, we don't grow, you know, we, we don't cultivate hemp, but certainly uh, friends, uh, business associates, and then of course, um, we're downstream from that. So to be able to have access to quality uh, hemp, you know, that was a concern whether people would be able to continue. So anyway, so we got an extension, uh, but um, we almost ran out of time. Is that, could that have been prevented? Is that possible? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So just a little bit of context for people who maybe didn't realize that so we, we were actually the, our pilot program was going to expire on Halloween at midnight right? Yeah. Um, this year. Uh, I was, you know, we were going to do a whole thing about the horrors of Halloween hemp expression. <laughs> um, and so I think something too, that's really important for folks to realize, especially outdoor growers, that a lot of people harvest the actual, their, their hemp or the flower in October. Mm -hmm. So people were very, very scared about coming close to that that deadline um, and, and their licenses no longer being, you know, able to be utilized. And I think that what was really scary about the potential of pilot program expiring um, was indoor growers who couldn't go a day without, with, with a lapse in a, in a license. Um, and so, yeah, I'm really happy that Congress extended the, the pilot program for another year, but you know, again, in this Farm Act, this Farm Act that keeps is going to keep keep coming up, right? Mm -hmm. um, this Farm Act that the legislature was considering, what happened is there was language removed from from that that would have actually given the North Carolina Department of Agriculture the authority to submit a state hemp plan to USDA. Um, and so I'm really just kind of shocked that the Department of Agriculture didn't fight harder to make sure that that language stayed in the text of the, the final text of the bill that passed. Um, you know, 
let the legislature has returned to session multiple times for for special sessions and since since you know this farm act passed they could have the, the north Carolina department of agriculture could have lobbied for the legislature to take up some sort of piece of legislation um to fight so that way the department of agriculture would have the authority to basically to write our own um language you know to, to create a pilot uh to create our own hemp hemp program here um i just you know i think that probably wasn't I, I feel like it's a lack of leadership, right? Mm. And if you weren't pushing for this to be a priority, it says to me that the industry as it's, as a whole wasn't that big of a priority for you. Hmm. Okay. Is there, uh, because from where I say it, obviously I see hemp and I talk to people in the industry all day long. So for me, it's, it's sort of my world. Uh, but for the Department of Ag in the state, um, curious why, you know, from your perspective, they might not see it as, as a priority because, uh, you know, hemp has brought in quite a lot of revenue to the state. And then of course, you know, we, we sort of export it, whether in hemp flour or in finished products to other states. And I mean, we're, we're one of the biggest producers in the country of hemp. So and that happens there... basically overnight. I mean, yeah, very fast, right? Like yeah. within a couple of years. Um, so is there somebody that, ha is there more of a, like a favorite child of sorts in like the, the department of ag? Like, is it, I, I don't know, is it like corn or something else or like, where are the, the other priorities for the department of, of ag right now? Well, I mean, you know, the commissioner himself is still engaged in tobacco. Uh, tobacco. Okay. And so, I mean, tobacco, you know, there's no arguing that tobacco built the, the roads the early roads and infrastructure in this state, right? There's a reason why mm -hmm. the colleges in, in North Carolina are, you know, along Tobacco Road, um, mm -hmm. as you call it. But I think what's really just upsetting is we had such an opportunity with this burgeoning economic opportunity for farmers to really go all in um, and make it possible for, for true economic success to come out of this industry. Uh, I think, you know, something like early on, I was talking to someone who was involved in the, the industry and there were something like seven to nine, 90 licensees and now there's over 1500 licensees to grow hemp in North Carolina. Um, but the, the actual hemp, hemp division, the hemp department uh, never expanded after its initial creation. So, I mean, there's just like literally a handful of people. I don't even think that there are a dozen people that kind of are overseeing this so. industry in the state. Isn't that insane? I mean, yeah. they're responsible for the education piece. Also people who are interested or potentially interested in getting involved in the industry, they can call and say, hey, like, what should I do? What are the steps? What type of soil do I need? Like, you know, what's the process? They're also responsible for, for processing all the licenses um, they're responsible kind of for overseeing testing and everything else. I mean, you know, this is just a, a massive industry and we have a handful of people overseeing it. Um, all right. So here, here's my stupid idea. I, so I, I threw this out to Dr. Coit um, in a previous fantastic, podcast. By the way. Who, she, yeah. I, I love her. She's amazing. Um, so in the hemp industry, there's a big issue with trust right? Uh, from one side to the other, you know, whether somebody buying or purchasing, this is the only industry I've been a part of where most of the, the deals are done uh, through text message. This is, it's crazy. Um, so my thought is, because uh, the commission in North Carolina has, has a lot of, a, a big, a large trust bank. People trust it, you know, they understand that there are advocates and that they, they want to see the industry flourish. And I wonder if there, there's some sort of a, maybe a marketplace that the commission can create where where you transact and you know hemp farmer can sell and you know maybe me as a processor can purchase um believing that those things have been vetted you know like this, the the commission will know that this uh, hemp came from this farm and that it's actually legit and that what it was grown under quality control yeah what, exactly yeah and they know was that it like, actually produced organically was it yeah yes exactly and that me as a processor you know that i've been vetted you know however that that would happen and like i wonder if that would be something that would one help the industry but then two just create maybe another sort of source of revenue for the the uh for the department of ag or you know the hemp commission um and just you know i think that the more people trust it the better the industry will be it's almost like this self-fulfilling cycle right like just right. Like this cycle of improvement tell me how stupid that is 
<laughs> or is there something to it? <laughs> actually, I think it's great. And I think because we didn't do what we needed to to begin with, I actually think that something like that is necessary at this point. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you why. So I think it's really important to remember that the North Carolina Department of Agriculture, the commissioner, it's, it's also the North Carolina Department of Agriculture and consumer part that often kind of gets um, and for me, I see the commissioner's responsibility, not just to help and promote agriculture and enhance agriculture, but also to be a consumer advocate, to be a watchdog for consumers, to make sure that they're getting a quality, pro a pr quality product. Mm -hmm. And so whether you're talking about the processors or the consumers, you know, I think there has been, because there's been all this miseducation, misinformation, because we haven't done a great job with quality control of the products. I have heard consumers say, oh, isn't hemp or CBD oil just snake oil, right? Mm -hmm. They're, you know, they're like, you don't know what you're actually getting when you purchase something, right? You're just, you're just trusting that that's what it is. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think making sure that that consumers are getting a quality product is absolutely critical to the long-term success of this industry. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I think that your idea is great um, because processors too. And so I have a number of friends that are processors and they're like, you know, we, we go and we spend a lot of time making sure that we do site visits for the, the farmers or growers that are engaged in hemp. But wouldn't it be nice if like we knew for sure, if we knew for sure that we were getting a quality product that we're, that we're processing? Um, because that also reflects on your long-term success as a mm -hmm. business owner uh, to, to make sure that what you're selling is indeed the highest quality product available. Yeah. All right. Well, if you need somebody to join that board, let me know. I think that could be something. I mean, you know, in, in a selfish way, but it really just in a way to help everybody. Because I think one of the cool things that I've been privileged to be a part of in this industry is that there are a lot of people that want to help each other, you know, like multiple processors working together. A lot of farmers work together, uh, you know, in, in, in um, neighboring farms and just trying to figure out how to help each other. So I think there's, there's some um, humanity to this industry that I think could be... Uh, improved with some like whether it's legislation or maybe just some influence or leadership by our our government you know i think there's a lot of good things that can more good things that can come of it um so with uh, talking a little bit more about business so I, I think you have your own um corporation is that um like, it's a it's a small business but it's mostly a consulting company um consulting, okay more more political and nonprofit work although we have worked with some um ag organizations out of state in, in places like Oklahoma or Texas that, that want to be able to expand certain agricultural education or fund a position to do ag ed in, in universities. But I will be honest, I have mostly had to take a step away from my business to be able to run statewide because North yeah. Carolina is a very big state. And yeah, when you're seriously. running against a 15 year incumbent, you have to spend every waking moment putting your whole heart and soul into, into, you know, kind of changing the narrative and letting right. people know that there's there's a new option for them. Yeah, okay. Um, so do you, because uh, you, you speak with so many different people on a daily basis, do you see certain opportunities in hemp that maybe people are not taking advantage of or that things that we should be preparing for? Yeah, so a few different things. First of all, so you're engaged in processing, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I think that people should be aware of what's happening with the DEA right now. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, I'm sure you can speak with more authority about this than I am. I'm someone who believes in, in listening to people with lived experience. You know, mm -hmm. every single day you're, you're a member of this industry, um, which also just goes to show, I think that we need more representative voices in the North Carolina Department of Ag. And we need to be, you know, compiling um, stakeholders in the industry who understand best what the problems are they're facing every day. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you talk about the DEA right now, you know, they passed that final interim rule, um, which would basically really harm processors because if at any point you have a, a product or it goes, you know, the THC content creeps above 0.3%, mm -hmm. it's then considered cannabis. And so you're then, uh, you fall under a schedule, having possession of a schedule one drug right. um, on your on your premises. And I know that they've opened back up the public comment period, the DEA has. So mm -hmm. I encourage anybody who cares about the hemp industry, anybody who cares about our processors, anybody who cares about the future of this industry, to, to, to make sure you make and submit public comments. I don't know when that, that window closes, um, but I just think that that could be incredibly, I mean, terrifying for anybody who's a processor because your long-term success, I mean, 
is definitely going, it, it's at stake right now. I mean, you could be shut down by the DEA for, for having a schedule one substance. I mean, you will lose ability to get loans and lending in the future. It will destroy your business. I mean, all the capital that you've put into it, your reputation, it'll, you know, you'll, you will have um, a record. I mean, this is something that we should be raising awareness about and doing something about. Yeah, absolutely. That uh, we, we lost a lot of sleep over that in the past few days. Um, and I, I did read an article, and I forget um, which uh, which newspaper put it out, but I think the DEA said something along the lines of uh, that they're, they're too busy with uh, opiates and uh, meth. I guess is a big issue right now, but still, just the fact that they said if you have th any product with THC over 0.3 at any point, uh, you know, you're basically engaging in an illegal activity, and so like. I just started sweating right away well, like, yeah. and everybody yeah, else. They did say something like, oh, you know, but like it kind of led to this idea of like, oh, but are we actually going to enforce it? You know, there's plenty of rules on the book, but will it actually be enforced? Sure. But I think that we should still be worried about it because what if one day they do decide to enforce it? Like this is something we should be yeah. concerned about. We have the opportunity now to fight back. We should absolutely not sit mm -hmm. on our hands. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I do not want to be that first one on the front page, <laughs> you know? Um, so let's see. Uh, so regarding the hemp industry in the next 12 months, um, let's say that you're elected. Um, what do you envision for the next 12 months, uh, whether it's just things that naturally occur or whether things that you're helping to make happen? Yeah. So first, um, immediately start lobbying the legislature to you know, to, to craft would be the legislation that would grant the North Carolina Department of Agriculture the authority to submit a state hemp plan to the USDA. Um, I think that that is absolutely critical um, because we want to make sure that we don't miss the next deadline, right? We got lucky with Congress ag agreeing to, to kind of extend these pilot programs, um, but we don't want to, to end up falling under them. And also that would be, you know, the fact that our our licensees here in North Carolina have to pay for either a one-year or three-year license. Well, if all of a sudden the, the hemp program expires, it doesn't matter if you just got your license for one year in like August of next year, and you have to have it to be able to harvest, harvest your hemp. And then September, we lose the ability to have to go under USDA's plan. Um, you know, you're still going to have to apply for a license for USDA. So, I mean, there's just that and like the USDA standards. I don't, I don't know how much you've You've, um, you've looked into them, but the testing protocol, everything is very, very different than what it is here in North Carolina. Yeah. You don't get as many chances. Um, and so I think it's just really important that we put power back in the hands of North Carolinians um, and we make sure that we have our own, uh, our own hemp, hemp program um, mm -hmm. that doesn't, doesn't just have to comply with USDA guidelines and that, that we don't miss the boat again. Yeah. Um, the other thing is I wish that we would spend a little more time creating more viable market opportunities. So whether for you to, to restore processors and consumer confidence in the product that they're getting, I think that's really important. Um, I also think connecting the dots and connecting members of the industry. So figuring out how we will be able to use um, CBD and other hemp-based products in other, other areas and agri agribusinesses in the state um, and creating a real market need for it. So that way, hemp growers have somewhere to sell their product. Um, and then the other thing is looking at the potential for fiber. So mm -hmm. I think that the North Carolina Department of Agriculture really thought that that's what most growers were going to engage in is growing the, the hemp plant for fiber instead of realizing they were going to, most of them were going to grow it for the flower. And, you know, I think that there are so many amazing applications of hemp fiber that we have just completely overlooked that would also, you know, very nicely coexist with other existing industries in the state. For instance, um, aerospace is a huge industry in North Carolina. A lot of people don't realize that, um, but there are, you know, hemp fiber could be used, has a number of applications for that. Um, automobile industry, hemp fiber could be used in car door panels. Um, if you refer back to like 1941, Henry Ford built a car using um, basically the, the cellulose fibers from hemp along with wheat straw that was that produced a vehicle that was lighter than steel, but 10 times, um, could suffer 10 times the impact before denting. Like, wow. it, I mean, it was just absolutely phenomenal. Why are we not looking at that? Or the fact yeah. that, you know, North Carolina used to have one of the, the biggest textile industries in the world and hemp fiber could absolutely be used for that. It could be used for plastics. I mean, why are we not 
why are we not helping connect farmers to viable opportunities to be successful? Is it, um, I was speaking with uh, Blake Butler. Um, I don't know if you two have met. Um, I mean, unfortunately, I don't believe so. Okay, I think he would be a great contact um, for you. But um, he mentioned that one of the things that would help with hemp fiber in the state is to, uh, for the university system to lead the research and just sort of like you know, protocols to so that then companies could come in and invest in those technologies or sort of those learned lessons. Because apparently I've only heard of a couple of companies that are doing fiber in the state. And so, you know, there's all this massive amount of farming, but the, the, the bottleneck is huge. So like that doesn't seem like it can advance into like I've seen people experimenting with uh, building homes with hemp. You mentioned, you know, cars and uh, space and all sorts of stuff, but with just a couple of companies that, that can't really flourish. Well, and there's only a few major processors in mm -hmm. the state that yeah. will pro that can process the fiber. Right. Um, and so, you know, that's obviously an industry that needs to expand it. It's expensive and there probably won't be any new uh, like fiber processors because there aren't enough growers that are, are growing it for the fiber, right? For to fiber. create that market demand. Okay. Um, and so, you know, I, I love the idea about working more closely with our, our research institutions. I mean, we have two of the best in the world with NC State and a and um, Let's absolutely give them the support and resources necessary in order to help this industry flourish. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and uh, let's see. So again, I, I couldn't even imagine what your life as a person in public office would be. So do you... Do you look to, to, let's just call it for what it is, like for, for personal development? Like, is that a thing? I mean, do you even have time for that? Like, whether it's like reading a book or coaching or anything along those lines? Um, I believe in being someone who is always personally bettering oneself and always trying to learn something new um, before I go to bed every night. Uh, although I don't get to sleep very much with with running this running this race, um, yeah, you know, and you mentioned cooking. So I, so in addition to to being a, a small producer myself, and um, while we rent the bulk of the farm, I still I still grow a seasonal garden of like six to ten acres every season too. And um, this past season, I did I planted like forty five rows of over thirty something different varieties of of fruits and vegetables. Plus, I've got nut trees and fruit trees and grapevines and everything else on our on our property um, and I absolutely love cooking and I see cooking as an extension of my love for agriculture and so I'm always trying to um, use something that either I myself grew or one of the farmers that you know I support I encourage people just with a quick shout out encourage people to think about going to farmers markets or roadside uh, produce stands as another form of you know going to a, a grocery store. I mean, but you get a higher quality product and you're actually keeping money um, and jobs here at home. So, you know, I, I do, I cook quite frequently. We've done a couple different uh, political fundraisers. I have one later this week. I had one the other week where I just cook live on camera for like an hour to two hours. And so like, I'll be like hand grating butter to make like to roll out my pie crust or Southern sure. buttermilk biscuits um, while I'm talking about cannabis legalization or mm. nuanced ag policy and how we move into sustainable and regenerative practices um, or what's happening to our farm workers and these meatpacking plants. And so, you know, it, people seem to really, really enjoy it too. It's very humanizing and it's something that I'm really passionate about. And I think that resonates with, with folks. Yeah. Cool. So, uh, best or favorite dish. Oh goodness. Um, I like to cook seasonally. Okay. So, you know, it, it, I guess it kind of depends. Um, obviously in the winter, like soups and stews are great, especially like if I'm using like kale or collard greens or any of the greens, mustard greens coming out, add a little spicy kick coming out mm -hmm. of my, coming out of my garden. Um, you know, recently I made a bunch of like quiche, um, with farm fresh eggs from North Carolina farmers and, nice. uh, all the peppers and stuff that came out of my garden. Um, you know, so it's just, it's just having fun with it. Yeah. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. So, um, Jenny, we covered a whole bunch of stuff, so I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, but if someone wants to learn more about you or, or perhaps contact you, where should they go? 
Yeah, um, well, first of all, thanks again for having me. But, uh, and if anyone wants to learn more, again, my name is Jenna Wadsworth. I'm the Democratic nominee for North Carolina Commissioner of Agriculture. You can check out my website at jennawadsworth.com. That's J-E-N-N-A-W-A-D-S-W-O-R-T-H.com. And from there, you can find links to all of our social media sites and my platform and a little bit more about me. Okay, fantastic. Well, and I'll put all that in the show notes. And uh, Jenna, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And best of luck uh, here in just a few weeks. Yeah, yeah. All right. So thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Hey guys, and before you go, this is Jason from Spectrum Labs. Please be sure to visit us on the web at thespectrumlabs.com for any show notes and links discussed in the podcast. Also, remember to click the subscribe button wherever you may be listening from so you get notified when our next episode comes out. And tune in next show and have a fantastic day.